Welcome to another episode of Team Anywhere, where CEOs, leaders, and experts at building teams, companies, organizations, and amazing cultures share how to lead from anywhere in the world. I'm your co-host on the East Coast, Ginny Bianco Mathis. And I'm your co-host on the West Coast, Mitch Simon. And we invite you to join us to Team Anywhere. Only 15% of companies that try to make a culture change are successful, yet culture, according to Satya Nadella at Microsoft, is the biggest predictor of future success. The main reason that culture change rarely ever works is because, well, it's really, really hard to change. That's why if you're trying to change your culture, you'll want to read Kevin Oak's book, Culture Renovation, 18 Leadership Actions to Build an Unshakable Company. In our discussion today, you'll find out why renovation to build an unshakable company beats transformation every time. Welcome to another episode of Team Anywhere. I'm your co-host, Ginny Bianco Mathis on the East Coast, and I'm here with my wonderful co-host, Mitch Simon, on the West Coast. And today we have a very distinguished guest that we have been wanting to have, Kevin Oaks. And Kevin is the CEO and founder of the Institute of Corporate Productivity. You all might have seen it through your emails and reports online as I4CP. And I remember seeing that for the first time and saying, you know, you know, what is that? So now I really know, which is the leading capital research company in the world, human capital, focusing on the people practices of high performance organizations. He was previously the founder and president of Sum Total System and chairman and CEO of Click to Learn um, and president and founder of Oaks Interactive. Kevin is a frequent international keynote speaker on using human capital strategically. He is the author of Culture Renovation, 18 Leadership Actions to Build an Unshakable Company. Welcome, Kevin. Thank you, Ginny, and uh, good to see you, Mitch. Thank you. It's great to be here. Wonderful. So we'd love to start off with something a little personal. Everyone has been going through their own renovations over the past two years. Um, what's, what's some things that you learned about yourself? Well, yeah, the last two years have been interesting. I um, Prior to the pandemic, Ginny, I was a, a road warrior. Uh, I traveled every week. Uh, I was uh, a one K on United Airlines and a top, you know, top customer on a number of other airlines, and so my travel, you know, just went down to nil. Uh, and I guess what I learned is uh, I don't need to travel as much as I used to, um, and so it's been refreshing. That you know, there's there's definitely things I miss about uh, traveling, uh, you know, around the world, and you know, just seeing so many great people and visiting so many great places. And I'm looking forward to getting back some of that travel. But I will never do it like I used to, uh, and it's been been refreshing to be, you know, with the family and uh, and and not uh, being in airports all the time. Yeah, so like all of us, we're sort of redefining, right? Well, going right. forward, what is that now going to look look like for me? Yeah, it's been yeah. wonderful. Well, let's get into the the topic of the book, uh, culture renovation, and. Um, we as business leaders understand the power of positive cultures. We we try to create those very dynamic cultures. And yet you all have found in your research that only 15% of companies that try to make such a culture change are successful. What's going on there? Yeah, I think a lot of CEOs, uh, they, they understand innately the, the connection between culture and having a financially sound company and uh, you know, the, the connection between culture and performance. But when they set out to try to change the culture, most of the time they fail. And, our, you know, you, you just quoted our research at 15 percent. But most other studies I've seen, Ginny, uh, have similar percentages. And the, and the main reason why there's so much failures is because it's really, really hard <laughs> to change culture. Um, my, uh, my father, who was a CEO of a couple of insurance companies, he's retired now. He read the book. Uh, and he said, boy, I wish I had some of these tips when I was running my company because I, 
I felt like the culture was in the woodwork of the company I inherited, right? No matter what I did, I just felt like I couldn't change things. And I think that's the way, you know, a lot of senior executives anyway feel about their, their companies, that culture it, it has a power of its own and, you know, it's hard to change. But what we've learned as part of the research and just studying some of these companies that were successful at changing culture is that you can, in fact, change culture. And it doesn't need to take very long to, to do so if you follow you know, some very prescribed steps. And that's what the book is all about. It's a, it's a blueprint for organizations to follow if they would like to uh, create a more healthy culture inside the organization. Okay, that's exciting. And of course, we want to hear those those tips that your father wanted to hear. Uh, but, but before we do, share with us how the whole um, pandemic um, and now the move to hybrid and virtual has affected this cultural uh, renovation initiative. Yeah. So you mentioned at the beginning, my company's a, an HR research firm. So we're doing more human capital research than just about anybody on the planet. And it's always with a business lens of what are high performing organizations doing differently with their people uh, versus low performing organizations. And as you can imagine, there's usually a big difference. And we uh, we look at specific practices that impact the bottom line uh, from an HR perspective. And the pandemic silver lining, I think, for HR has been the spotlight on HR uh, has never been brighter. And as a result, more and more companies are recognizing they need more strategic HR uh, in their organization. And I love walking into companies where that CHRO is the right hand person to the CEO, CEO and uh, and they treat that person as uh, you know part of the inner circle. You know, they're part of that you know two or three person. Uh, inner circle inside the organization. But, you know, this last two years has showed us that the companies that had that in place already uh, have fared much better than those that did not, because work has has changed dramatically and, and has changed forever. And so as we talk about hybrid and, and remote work um, uh, versus on site or, you know, uh, in the office, uh, it's been very interesting how companies have shifted their opinions on that uh, and shifted some of their policies. We've done a ton of research over the last uh, year and a half uh, and have hosted countless meetings of HR executives uh, discussing what they're going to do going forward, how they're handling the pandemic. And I could not be more proud of my team. I, we've had a lot of companies tell us we couldn't have gotten through this without you. And the, the research you've done has been invaluable. But it's, um, it shows the power of peer connections, I think, um, more than anything. Nobody planned for this. Nobody, you know, experienced this before. So, you know, really being able to bounce ideas and bounce, um, you know, just thoughts off of other HR executives has been very helpful for the folks we deal with. Um, we came out with a study, though, about three months ago called From Cube to Cloud. And it's this movement from, uh, you know, from cubes to a virtual environment. And in that study, we had some very strong recommendations, one of which was, Forcing people back to the office is a mistake. And we, we mean that even if it's two days a week. Um, I think what you're seeing in most organizations today is they are recognizing that hybrid work or flexible work and remote work can work. Um, too often, I'm finding there are companies where they're basing their, their peanut butter spread policy that's supposed to apply to everybody um, on the the gut reaction of the CEO or the, you know, the personal preference of, uh, of the CEO and senior executive team. And anytime you have that kind of blanket policy, it's not going to work for everybody. And I've, I've just seen policy after policy be rolled out inside of companies where you have immediate exceptions uh, to the policy, because I think we've also learned in the, during the pandemic, everybody has a unique situation. You know, some have elder care responsibilities. There's a lot of child care responsibilities that we didn't quite comprehend before, and we got to know our coworkers a lot better. But pushing the the authority or the autonomy down to managers is what I'm seeing a lot of smart companies do. And another piece of advice we had was let your managers manage. Uh, they should be able to figure out what's best for the organization, what's best for the individual. And I'm seeing a lot of companies kind of walk back earlier policies, change their policies, which I give them kudos for, that they have the 
uh, you know, the humility to change their policies and, and recognize that what we said earlier maybe isn't the best route for us going forward. So right. this is yes. ongoing. It's not over yet. Um, you know, and we've we've got the vaccine mandate issues to deal with, and we're spending a lot of time working with companies around that. Even though there's a temporary stay, we're trying to, you know, help companies prepare for what is probably inevitable. And so, um, you know, it's, it's a very interesting time in, in, uh, in organizations right now. Yeah, it's a, it's a moving target. And you mentioned this already. Um, the dialogue and conversation has to be, you have to create space for that in a very deliberate way. For sure. Well, let's, let's sort of jump to the end. So you're, you are consulting with a company who is, wants to uh, have a culture renovation and they're going to they're doing it right. And if you can throw in some real examples as, as you share the five, I made that up. <laughs> <laughs> Don't go through all 18. Um, no, I won't. I never do. Don't worry. You, uh, buy, that, you buy the book if you want to see all 18. Yeah, exactly. That um, sh- will move the needle on this. Yeah. Well, first, I think it's important to understand how we organized these 18 action steps. Um, let me talk a little bit about why we call this culture renovation first. Uh, when we um, started researching this topic, this, we, this was a research report before it was a book. Um, we were fascinated by this issue of not being very successful in trying to change culture. And as we got into it, we were talking about this in terms of culture transformation. That's the way most people talk about it. And we were using that term and that was the title of our research until it dawned on us that all the successful companies did not at all transform their cultures. Nobody really does. They don't make it completely different from what it was before. Instead, they renovate. And those successful companies were holding on to what made them unique to, uh, to begin with and what made them successful uh, to begin with, and some of their core values, and a lot of times their purpose, but they were like an old house. They were renovating for the future to increase the future value. And in an old house, what you do is you you keep the uh, you know what makes that house unique or what's you know impossible to replace, and you update it and renovate it so that you can increase that value. Um, but if you're going to go renovate an old house, you don't do so without having a plan to begin with, right? You don't go in and just start knocking down walls. Uh, because you're going to knock down a load-bearing wall probably and and take the whole thing down. The same is true for an organization. So we organized those 18 steps using that renovation theme uh, into three phases. Plan uh, is the first phase, build, and then maintain. Uh, And those are important to think about. Um, A lot of companies, when they want to change culture, they kind of dive right into it uh, instead of taking the necessary steps to to plan out what they want to do. And I'll I'll give you a couple highlights of that phase before we talk about actually building it. And then the last one is just as important. A lot of times there's a lot of hoopla around changing culture. They make some good changes, but they don't do enough to maintain it. And so things start to drift back to the way it used to be, right? And so that maintain part is is important. Um, In the plan phase, we start out by saying that the worst thing an executive team can do is lock themselves in a conference room and decide amongst themselves what the culture is today and what it needs to be tomorrow, because they'll get it wrong. Um, Everything is filtered by the time it gets up to an executive team. So you really have to uh, have a comprehensive listening strategy so you can understand the employee's sentiment uh, and have a variety of ways that you get gather that sentiment. Don't just rely on an annual engagement survey. That'll be a false proxy for for the culture. That's a point in time. You need to have people be able to express in their own words um, what the culture is and what what's needed uh, and do it through a variety of methods. And so you can read the chapter if you want want some insight on those methods. Um, But once that happens, uh, it's important to identify inside the company the influencers uh, and the energizers that exist in your workforce. Every organization has this. There are people that everybody seems to go to for subject matter expertise, uh, for who should I talk to, uh, sometimes just for uh, a pep talk, right? And for energy. Yeah. And if you ask, again, if you ask those senior leaders that are locked in the conference room, hey, who are those people? Uh, They will get less than half of them right. We know that through through research that that's the case. 
And the reason they get less than half of them right is um, they tend to think in terms of the hierarchy um, and who's at the top of the hierarchy. Uh, the people that I'm talking about are usually buried in the hierarchy. They're not always that visible. A lot of times they're introverts, not extroverts. Um, and the way work gets done is through a network structure, not through a hierarchy. And this is through a science that we're big believers in called organizational network analysis, where you can yep, actually- I love it. Yeah, you can actually track and pinpoint who's at the center of that beehive. Who does everybody turn to yep. uh, for, for information and for energy? And those are the people you want to be your culture ambassadors. If you're trying to change- hey, Kevin, I'm going to stop you a second. Yeah, go ahead. Because okay. <laughs> what, if I'm now a hybrid, so I got some virtual, you know, some down the hall, how am I going to create, get, do that organizational network analysis? It shouldn't matter. Uh, so o ONA um, happens through a series of surveys where you can triangulate, you know, who is at the center of the information flow. And that's what you're trying to determine is information flow. It doesn't matter if it's in person or remote. Uh, it's who are people turning to uh, for that information or for energy. And those are the people you want to be the culture ambassadors, Ginny. Uh, those are the people when you're trying to change your culture, you want them on board early. You want them on the inside, knowing what you're trying to accomplish, because they will have much more influence over the rest of the workforce than just the senior team trumpeting right. what you want to do. And, and just for, the, for those out there that have never experienced this, even though they're surveys, they are high, highly reliable and, and um, yep. accurate because all you're really doing is asking each person, who do you go to for information? Who yeah, do you there's go a few to other in questions of, like that, but yes, you're right. You can yes, also, yeah, you can also track um, email and, and uh, things like Slack or Teams. That's a little invasive to do that. It doesn't always give you the best info, but yeah, so it's a, this is a science that's been around for a little while and um, right. it's incredibly powerful, especially when you're trying to change culture. And especially now I'm, uh, I'm pushing with the hybrid and the virtual, because I, as you said, absolutely. it doesn't matter. You can still do it. In fact, that might even give you more false positives if you're over relying on who's in the office right. and thinking those are the real key people. It's not going to be the case. You know, there's a, a lot of key people that are remote. So that's part of the uh, that's part of the plan phase. Um, you know, the the other aspect that we talk about in the beginning is just setting out how you're going to measure and monitor your your culture over time. It's a lot of different ways companies measure that, um, but you want to you want to uh, be able to you know just mark your ongoing progress uh, and make sure that if things start to go south, that your measurements are going to tell you early. Uh, and be early indicators of that. And so we talk a lot about um, the best ways to measure and setting those up right at the beginning. So give me, uh, if you could, give us, um, can you give us an example of a company that's done this well? Yeah, that's an easy one for me. I, and I profile this company early in the book, but it's Microsoft. Um, and they are a fabulous case study, whether you're a big company or small, whether you're in tech or not, um, public or private, to follow what Satya Nadella and the team there have done. When Satya took over that company, um, it was not doing well. And there were a lot of people predicting that Microsoft was going to go the way of Sears, that, you know, it was going to be a, a once relevant company that, you know, was just going to sort of die a slow death. What a curse. Yes. Yeah. So, um, you know, Satya said it in his very first shareholder meeting. He said, our ability to uh, to change our culture is going to be the biggest predictor of our future success. And he meant financial success. And he partnered with Kathleen Hogan, who's the head of HR there and with the HR team and rallied the company around some simple concepts, one of which was growth mindset. And I talk a lot about this in the book um, where, you know, the company really understood that uh, it, it's not knowledge, it's is power. It's knowledge sharing is power. And Satya has been very vocal about the fact that he doesn't want a bunch of know-it-alls. He wants a bunch of learn-it-alls inside the organization. And I'll tell you, when he took over the company, it was a bunch of know-it-alls. And they were very, um, they use knowledge in a, in a very uh, powerful way. And a lot of companies do this, you know, where people would protect their, their, their self, their fiefdoms, you know, by withholding knowledge. 
Uh, you don't see that at Microsoft, not as much anyway today. And it's been a big reason why the company has had such a dramatic turnaround. And as we record this, they're the most valuable company in the world. Uh, he has you know, turned that company into the highest market cap in the world. And while you know, a lot goes into that, you know, there's been some acquisitions along the way and you know, great products, et cetera. There's not a single person at Microsoft that wouldn't tell you the culture shift has been a big reason for that turnaround. Right. Now, do you find, uh, how do you handle, and I, you, you do mentioned you got to also know your blockers. Yeah. Uh, and, and let's hope that the, the CEO is not one of the blockers, but it could happen. Could how, happen. how do you handle those blockers? Well, it's funny. I, I do a lot of public speaking, as you mentioned, and uh, I get that question from time to time. And I always say that's one of the toughest questions I have to answer <laughs> uh, because it's not easy to change culture if the CEO doesn't want it to happen. Uh, it's not to say it's impossible, but it's really, really hard. Uh, and so the first thing I would do if you've got an uncooperative CEO is use data, um, you know, around uh, some of these great, you know, culture shifts that have happened and some of the data that we outlined in the book and use case studies from companies that that organization either respects or even fears and try to convince the CEO that, you know, some changes need to be made. Uh, because without that cooperation, it's going to be really, it's going to be a challenge for sure. You have to educate. Yeah. You know, and slowly, you know, bring them along, obviously. You talk about defining the behaviors of the culture that you're trying as you're renovating. And um, especially with hybrid and virtual, uh, how does that work? I mean, is there a difference in terms of the behavior that I might want now if they're all, you know, they're all sitting here, but now you're virtual? Uh, have, being a part of those discussions, what do they look and sound like? Yeah, you know, employees aren't going to do what's written in a PowerPoint or framed on a wall. Uh, they're going to do what leaders do. And it's important when you're setting out your new culture that you train your leaders on emulating the behaviors that you expect and that, uh, that represent the values and, you know, the purpose of the organization. And so I have some good case studies in, uh, in the book around companies that have done a very good job at that. Uh, but it's important that uh, really, particularly that senior team, but anybody who's a people leader inside the organization is emulating those behaviors. And that takes, that takes a lot of work. Um, we found that um, the companies that were successful at changing the culture, they put a lot more time, energy, and budget into training than the ones that did not have success at changing culture. So you've got to You've got to focus on that training element uh, to make sure that this that the the behaviors happen. What and, type and, of um, what type of trainings? Um, what type of behavioral trainings um, have you found it to be successful? Yeah, Mitch. There's a uh, you know obviously right now <laughs> uh, most of the training is happening virtually, and a lot of uh, companies are doing uh, both synchronous online and have done some asynchronous uh, online training for for those behaviors. Um, but before the pandemic, companies, you know, were certainly using a variety of methods uh, to make that happen. So, you know, certainly there was an instructor led component uh, to this. I've always been a big fan of leaders as teachers. Um, you never learn a subject as as best as when you're forced to teach it. You know, and GE made that very popular early on. But a lot of companies that we find are high performers, they have their leaders actively teaching uh, some of these uh of behavioral courses and at the same time, you know, reinforcing what they need um, as leaders inside the company. So I think that can be another effective method. Making sure they're right there. Um, they can lead one little part, but more importantly, they're participating. They're throwing their words up there right. Um, as, yeah, right. as we get to it. Um, this is fascinating, and uh, I know you'll keep you can keep going through right each chapter of your book. So, share with our audience uh, how they can get in touch with you, your folks, and get the book. Well, there's a website dedicated to the book at culturerenovation.com, and it has uh, a number of things that are in addition to the book. So, other case studies that we couldn't fit in the book. Uh, there's a monthly newsletter that I write um, about uh, culture change efforts. 
um, and a number of tools that organizations can use uh, to help change their culture. So go out to culturerenovation.com and you'll have everything you need around this subject uh, to help make an impact inside the company. Oh, that's wonderful that you're sharing the tools. Uh, you know, that's what that's what we want. We want to get our hands on that stuff. Great. That's fabulous. Mm-hmm. And um, you, of course, are on LinkedIn, I take it, and your company is all over the place. So. <laughs> yeah, you can find our company at uh, i4cp.com. Uh, and uh, yes, I'm certainly on all the social channels. Right, right. Well, I'm certainly going to make your book, the book, um, uh, part of uh, my MBA curriculum. Oh, excellent. Uh, and uh, many clients, too, because I love the fact that you did put case studies in there and tools. So, so wonderful. Mitch. Um, gosh, thank you so much, uh, Kevin. And I'm on your website and there's so many resources. So definitely for our listeners, you want to you want to go to culturerenovation.com and you want to go to all the websites that um, Kevin has mentioned. Um, thank you, Jenny, for hosting. And thank you to our listeners um, who are going to be going out there and renovating their own cultures. And uh, please share this episode with your friends, family, and colleagues. And we look forward to seeing you next time on Team Anywhere. Anywhere.